Uh, thank you so much, Edgar Cruz uh, from Colombia. Um, the question is as follows. Uh, multilateral development banks, and I know the World Bank has a, a climate screening tool. I would like to ask what is the experience, if, if, there is, if it is something documented, or what are the outcomes, what are the lessons learned from applying such tools on uh, early project screening, and what have you be able to learn to better structure projects? Thank you. Okay, very good. Can we take a couple of questions? Um, uh, just a question. In the, at the beginning, you mentioned that would, there should be like a, um, more work to be done in the assessment or uh, in the preparation of projects to uh, to, uh, to evaluate the environmental impacts. Um, my question is like, what what is the extra cost that is there if you have, I mean, I'm sure you have done the studies because in accessing GCF, for example, I mean, there is a long list of prerequisites um, that relates to social and environmental safeguards. And this adds a lot to the preparation, like the cost of preparing the projects. So how would this really help in facilitating access uh, to projects and, and really um, allow things to move as quickly as, uh, as requested or as needed? Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want some clarification on your presentation. That you mentioned about uh, green bond in Colombia Road and uh, also in Kenya Water. If if you were uh, uh, emphasizing the investment friendly environment, which means what does that mean exactly? I'm uh, curious to know about that because if you are really guaranteeing certain uh, return from investment, then it can happen anyway in the commercial sector. So we don't have to intervene over there. So what was the difference in your project, in the road project in Colombia, also water in Kenya, whether if, if it is just for interest and the returns on investment, it will happen in any way. So what has been the difference between the project you have mentioned about it and what is your definition of investment friendly? If it's investment friendly, like guaranteeing the return, then it will happen anyway, right? So, so what is the difference between sustainable approach and the commercial approach? So three questions, I think. One around screening, the second around the safeguards cost, and then the third around the basic market approach to, to all of this. So the, the answer to the first question, I think, is, uh, is very pertinent. I mean, we've just done a, a study, actually, around uh, what we've learned from uh, screening. We've, we've done it now for over uh, 18 months. Um, it was part of the uh, IDA 17 uh, commitment. Um, and I think as we, in fact, over, over two years now, and we've, we've you know, complied with uh, the requirement to uh, screen all our projects. Uh, I think what we've learned, and now we've extended it from IDA to IBRD as well. I think what we've learned is that uh, this needs to be really user-friendly for the people who are doing the design of the project. Uh, and I think that it's easy to uh, ensure that you've complied. Uh, the question is, have you really changed the project in a way that gives you more confidence that you've screened it more effectively? And again, from our experience, I think deepening the knowledge base within the institution of people who really understand uh, those tools and the implications of climate change has been a major win. Uh, but it's taken time, and now we can build on that, I think, as we go forward. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I can talk specifically about the GCF. I don't think that would be, but I can talk about our own uh, environmental um, standards uh, framework, which of course is new and recently been developed, uh, and has some uh, climate uh, aspects to it. So for example, around uh, greenhouse gas accounting uh, and the requirement for that on certain types of projects. Now, of course, this is uh, an incremental cost, but you know, we see a very strong benefit in terms of getting uh, much better information around uh, the implications of some of these projects, and also in terms of um, building capacity to uh, evaluate uh, it uh, more um, comprehensively in individual countries. So uh, I, I recognize the cost, but I do think there's also significant benefits. And then the third question, I think in terms of uh, deepening financial markets, I mean, the work that we did in Colombia uh, is around... Um, really making sure that the project bond is designed in the best possible way. And so that means, you know, who are the right counterparts? What are the, how do you attract uh, people to invest in that bond? So, you know, 
then you've, you've got to compete with other uh, potential uh, investments. Um, so how do you do that to make sure that these projects are attractive without actually uh, distorting the market? Because as you say, if you over guarantee some of these projects, then you don't need to, uh, to, to do them. But what we find is most of them do need a bit of help uh, to get them to be uh, competitive with uh, other forms of investment. And particularly if you think across the um, multinational aspects of this, uh, what we're doing is trying to make these countries more attractive to investors um, to enable, uh, you know, they, they, some of them are, you know, marginal. So how do you make them uh, more credit worthy and reduce that sovereign risk? So that's really the, the sort of uh, intervention that we're trying to design. So I think I saw a couple more questions. There's one there, and there was one at the back there, um, and, and then there's a couple more over there. Uh, OK, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kamal. I'm from Algeria. Uh, I thank you for your excellent presentation, which was uh, really very good. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, with regard to the issue of barriers, uh, which is this fourth session is dedicated to barriers for yes. uh, climate re resilient infrastructure financing. Uh, don't you think that mobilizing finance is one of the barriers that we are facing? And this is why we are here in this forum. Uh, for example, if we take your fifth slide, in your fifth slide, in the four steps you are presenting, uh, nothing raised on, uh, on the issue of mobilizing. And uh, the, the last step is just uh, finance structuring. And where do you locate this uh, or institute this mobilizing finance uh, in your presentation or uh, all over this process? I thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question uh, is similar to that there. I can't help but think about your last slide, which has um, a few points about the way forward. And I, I'm trying to get uh, an understanding of the institutional change from let's say a World Bank of access. Um, I'm seeing in that slide a lot of weight is being placed on countries and government. And as uh, a question that was raised earlier, there's a lot of requirements to accessing funds and a lot of the capacity within those countries aren't there. How is it that we get funds mobilized? What is the institutions on the other end of the spectrum doing? Bejrit Mohamed from the Moroccan Road Administration. Thank you for your presentation. You mentioned uh, an amount of uh, 391 billion uh, for climate resilient infrastructure financing in 2015. Could you tell us what, what was the part which uh, went to developing countries and which was the part which went to conservation versus uh, development? My second question, uh, is there uh, the problem of building capacities in uh, developing countries is uh, real to prepare a, a bankable project for uh, multilateral financing? Uh, have you in the World Bank detailed guidelines uh, for this? Thank you. Yeah. The mobile, I mean, in so many ways, they, they kind of converge these three questions. It, um, I mean, look, you know, I think what's evident is that we need um, enormous amounts of finance to support the uh, transition to a low-carbon future. Um, we, uh, we have, uh, through, you know, in the bank, uh, our IDA 17, um, uh, IDA 18 replenishments, we have $75 billion dollars. Uh, uh, you know, we're committed to achieving the 28% target by 2020, um, and we're looking to mobilize as much finance to go alongside that as we possibly can, which is why we're framing uh, this conversation exactly in this way. Um, we need you know, to unlock a lot of the other uh, pieces of finance that are uh, extremely important around this. So uh, we have an opportunity with the Clean Technology Fund 2.0, uh, to securitize the reflows there to create uh, another uh, couple of billion dollars worth of climate finance. So we have to think innovatively around the way in which we uh, use the resources that we've got as effectively as possible and how we mobilize uh, the money to 
uh, enable us to do these four points that are, uh, oh, they've gone now, but the four um, barriers. I mean, the, the point about the barriers is uh, they should enable this uh, mobilization. Um, but of course, there's a sort of um, uh, chicken and an egg around all of this. So we need to think uh, about how we uh, align that as effectively as possible. I think the, uh, uh, the, other, the other question was around the 351 uh, billion. Um, now, off the top of my head, I can't quite remember exactly uh, how, which proportion of uh, that money goes where. Um, I think, uh, and I, I wouldn't like to say it in this forum without going back to the original data, but I think uh, we do recognize that um, we need to get this money flowing uh, more to developing countries, and that's obviously why uh, we're um, doing what we're doing around uh, making our portfolio much more uh, climate smart, much more climate friendly. Um, and then I think you know, that also links to the point, I think, around how do we get smarter around giving people the tools that enable this to do this effectively. And the, the screening tools are one part of it, but they're only one part. There are other bits as well. And I think um, we need also to increase our level of ambition in, around, around this as well. You know, what, what can we do at scale? How do we create programmatic approaches to, uh, to this? So, for example, uh, the West Africa Coastal Area Program is a good example of trying to pull together uh, the challenges that many countries face and presenting it as a, as a program to attract the kind of uh, finance that's needed. Much of that will be heavily concessional to enable uh, West Africa coastal area to become more, uh, more resilient. So looking to do uh, these activities at much greater scale. Okay. So I think we're probably out of time from the question front, aren't we?